Hi there, my name is Bruce, and this is the fifth episode of Startup Disky's Full Tech Chat, where we talk about all things tech. I'm here with Jay and our very special guest, Sean from Action Retro. And today's topic is Linux. Sean, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm very glad to have you here. Because we're talking about Linux, you were our second choice uh, after Jessica Alba to have on the Linux. show to talk about this. I've never um, heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, look, most computer users, they sort of fall into either Windows or um, Mac OS, OS X, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to start this off with a, a quick little anecdote. Um, so everyone sit around and listen to Uncle Bruce. The When I was... Uh, a lot younger. I used Macintosh OS in a design studio. This is like in the, uh, I started doing that probably a bit late 80s, early 90s. And round about, people probably, some people may not be aware of this, but round about in the sort of mid to late 90s or mid 90s, things got really rocky for Apple. And I remember one of my customers that was a Windows user, it came into me and said, oh, you know, Apple's got 12 months left, if that. And I remember at the time this, this, you know, this sort of feeling of, okay, well, if Apple does go, what, what would I move to? What would I start using? I, I don't want to use Windows. I really don't like using Windows. I don't like the Windows experience. So if Apple is gone, what, what will I use? And it's something that I've, I've, I've thought about, you know, sort of over many years and just sort of thought to myself, you know, will there ever be an alternative operating system that, motivates me enough to want to, you know, potentially change to something else. Now, Linux has been around since what, the early 90s or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, for a long time, it was really just sort of for the tech heads, I think, you know, for, you know, being used on, you know, file servers and stuff like that. But now with a lot of distributions with that have, you know, pretty desktops, nice graphical user interfaces, you know, I, I sort of figured, well, let's check and see whether Linux could actually be a viable alternative for our daily drivers. So that was the general sort of premise of, uh, of this show. And so the idea was that we would each uh, install uh, a, a version, a distribution of a distro of Linux onto a, a different computer and try it out. To see what the experience is like, and uh, and and you know, sort of go from there. So, uh, Jay, over to you. Tell us a little bit about the setup um, that you have used for this experiment. Will do. Um, the well, there were kind of two goals when we were planning the show. It was what you just said: how viable is Linux as an alternate OS, and kind of like how can we keep our very old computers going with Linux? I didn't have a very old computer. So, I mean, by modern standards, this is ancient. But I have here a 13-inch mid-2012 MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's not that old, but people might disagree. <laughs> and I installed El uh, Elementary OS 6.1. Mm -hmm. uh, and I picked this one because apparently it's the one that looks and feels most like Mac OS. Um, it's an i7, 16 gigs of RAM, and it absolutely flies on this version of Linux. Not that Mac OS X is slow on it. It's not. But this is, I mean, from pressing the power button to logging in, it's like two seconds. It's crazy. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I'll I'll save my my notes and comments for uh, for later, but uh, it it runs well. I'll say that. And and Sean, um, did you uh, pick a computer for this experiment? Well, here's the thing: you uh, grabbed me in a little bit late, but I kind of. Well, no, no, no. We grabbed you way early, but you just took forever to respond. <laughs> I kind of just so happened to have uh, done this on my own. Um, in fact, I, for many years, I was a daily driver of Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started my YouTube channel, all those videos were edited on Linux. Uh, I really enjoyed using Linux. Um, I kind of think of myself as kind of a computing pragmatist. So Linux really served my purposes when I was using it. Now that I'm really into video editing, I've switched to Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there are 
too dissimilar of a platform. Um, but a lot of the software that I wanted to use, well, specifically DaVinci Resolve, runs on Linux but runs better on Mac. Really? I, I was actually going to ask you that because I did actually have a crack at installing DaVinci Resolve on the computer that I used, and I couldn't even get it to launch. Hmm. Uh, it did not like the GPU that was built into the laptop that I used. So it's an old laptop, so that's fair enough. But I thought it might at least run slowly, but no, won't even get started. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's one, one of the, the things about Linux is... Uh, mm. You know, it runs on just about anything, but can the anything run what you want it to run? <laughs> yes, indeed. So, um, okay, so yeah, w th which computer did uh, did you end up using for, for me? Experiment? Yeah. Well, I didn't you, do the experiment. But when so you would, when you were doing driver, this editing, yeah, yeah. my non-experimental daily driver, oh. uh, I use a whole bunch of different laptops. I've used ThinkPads. Um, most recently, I used a MSI um, something or other, Prestige 15. Yeah. And that okay. was the greatest Linux laptop I've ever used. Uh, okay. Everything on it ran flawlessly. The battery life was fantastic after some tweaks, uh, which, of course, is the story of Linux and is my favorite part of Linux. The <laughs> and, uh, yeah, DaVinci Resolve ran great on that, along with other video editors. The GPU is fully supported uh, drivers out of the box for all the different distros that I've tried on it, which is another fun part of Linux, trying all the distros. Uh, oh. Yeah, so, so let's see, that was my experiment laptop, oh. the MSI Prestige 15. So I guess the the this whole concept of a distro, so essentially you've got a, a, you've got this Linux what main kernel or something kernel at the, at the base of it or something like that, and then people then release linux with all sorts of different it's it, it's it's like just window dressing isn't it or, or are they actually pairing back on some of the features i mean the, sort of the what's what's the why choose one distro over another i guess well that's the biggest question <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so I mean, the the core of Linux is the Linux kernel, and that's what, you know, Linus Torvald still is, you know, kind of the arbiter of everything that goes into the Linux kernel. Uh, but it's free and open source software, so people can do whatever they want to it. So all the different distros, usually if it's a big distro, it's a mix of tweaking the kernel for performance and do, doing some stuff to the kernel, um, compiling it for certain architectures, uh, and also the software that they include with it. And that's a lot of the distribution aspect of it is they're distributing all the other software. Mm. Uh, so your fancy window managers, some of those might be tweaked. You know, your desktop environments might be tweaked. Um, yeah, and then, you know, a lot of distros, there's general use distros like Ubuntu and elementary OS and, and all of those. And then there's, you know, distros for very specific things like to run on old computers or to run on software. Uh, servers um, to run on, you know, like tiny core Linux is an extremely uh, pared down version of Linux. I can run modern Linux on like a 486 with two megs of RAM. Mm -hmm. uh, so really the choice of distribution is vast and it's both a feature and a curse. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I, uh, I'm just going to show, I've got a little image here. Uh, this is uh, my, uh, installation here. I, it was a, a 2010 um, i7 MacBook Pro 17 inch, so a nice big screen there. Uh, one of the first things I did was I put one of the Mac, Mac OS desktop patterns on there and I moved the dock from the left hand side to the bottom because I hate the dock on the left hand side. But that's basically, I used Ubuntu, what is it? I think 2204, I think is the latest one. Um, I will say that the process of installation of that was absolutely seamless, uh, you know, given the fact that, you know, it's running on this Mac hardware, it just started up and everything worked. Wi-Fi worked, Ethernet worked, um, you know, it already came, as you say, with this, in terms of distro, it already come, when you install it, it installs LibreOffice on there as well. So, you know, it already has uh, a suite of, of, of software on there. It's even got a solitaire game. I mean, come on, that's the best thing ever. Um, so, yeah, it was a very, very easy installation process. 
Um, Jay, was yours an easy installation process? No. <laughs> well, uh, no. Uh, sorry. The installation was uh, smooth. Uh, and I think I might be wrong, but from what I read, the installation for pretty much any version of Linux is the same on most Macs. You you get the disk image, you use a Blina Etcher to put on a flash drive and install it. Mm-hmm. I was up and running. Uh, I think I was talking to you guys in the chat and said, oh, I'm going to use this distro. And two minutes later, I said, okay, it's up and running. So it was really pretty much instant. Um, but after that, the, the phone stopped for me. It doesn't come with anything. It doesn't even come with Wi-Fi drivers. Uh, you have to do software update to get the Wi-Fi drivers. But if you don't have Ethernet, you're screwed. <laughs> Luckily, I had <laughs> Ethernet. So I was able to do the software updates, uh, which was about 200 of them, including Wi-Fi. Uh, ran mm. for a while, gave me Wi-Fi, and then it was up and running. Um, but yeah, it doesn't come with anything. Uh, mm. No, It's... It's it's quite ironic because elementary OS is as you say. I've, elementary was what I was going to install if I hadn't been to, if you if you hadn't been using it really, um, and that was because it's a really nice looking distro. I've seen some screen snaps and it looks nice, and so I thought I would give that a try. And uh, what I'd read on some of these was it is very Mac OS like, and you sort of figure if you're going to draw Mac OS users in to use your distro, you're going to have to be you know, everything should be included because people who use Macs are used to just things installing and working. So, uh, if you know, the fact that you had to go to those links to sort of get the, the Wi-Fi drivers and that, I guess, is a little bit contradictory to the distro that's meant yeah. to be most like a Mac OS. But I uh, mean, it, it does look really slick. Um, it the, the shortcomings of this operating system are probably not the operating system's fault, it's me. Because I have no idea how to navigate Linux oh. apart from through a terminal now. Um, installing stuff is a nightmare for me anyway. It doesn't have an app store. It has, uh, what's it called? I don't even know what it's called. I think it's called Programs. or It has an app store-like thing, but everything on there is paid software. Nothing free on there. Hmm, interesting. Okay. So you start looking around, and I figured out pretty quickly that the only way to navigate Linux is by using Google. You just ask Google whatever you're trying to accomplish and let some website tell you. Um, and that's how mm-hmm. I found out that either you install uh, stuff through the terminal or you get it from App Snap, Snap, Snap App, whatever it's called, which mm-hmm. is not included on the OS. It's a website mm-hmm. that gives you terminal commands so that you can then install it through the terminal oh. completely backwards but there is uh this is just mentioning is because she said it there is a, a graphic user interface snap on ubuntu so when you install the ubuntu 2204 you can launch the snap app thing and it will just bring up a like a, a nice graphic user interface. You can do a search for a particular app, and then it literally just press an install button. So they've taken that with Ubuntu. They've taken that a little bit a bit further. And obviously, that means more bloat. It means there's more being installed on your system to start off with. Elementary is obviously a much lighter weight um, distro, but um, but that was one thing which I was quite impressed with when I installed Ubuntu was that I was able to go into this app thing. And it had a few suggestions there. Here are a few suggestions, some good apps, some good apps to use, and then you could do searches and find stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm happy that you had it so easy. <laughs> happy for you. <laughs> well, someone had to. Someone had to do it. Jay. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, it had, yeah. had to be you. But uh, um, but that in itself is is an interesting thing because. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll go through sort of I guess you know various aspects of our experience of using. Linux as we go, but um, the one of the things that Linux has, to, it, it, you know, to its advantage is the fact that first of all, Linux is open, so it's free. You can basically get hold of these. Uh, maybe in uh, some enterprise situations, you might end up needing to pay for it, but but you know, for the general user, they can just download this stuff for free and they can install it. And so, you know, 
you, there's that whole thing about, you know, beggars can't be choosers. I mean, this is really, it's free. And the same can basically be said about the software. I mean, there's lots and lots of different software out there. It's like, oh, okay, I'm looking for a, a graphics editing program. Well, Photoshop's not available for Linux, but hey, there's this software called GIMP. Uh, Adobe Illustrator's not available, but there's this software called I think, Inkscape. Uh, Adobe InDesign's not available on Linux, but oh, there's this, um, I can't remember what it's called, uh, but there's a, there's a page layout software that is available. And all of these are open source um, applications that cost nothing to install. So there is a huge benefit in being able to get all of this software for free, essentially install this suite of applications onto this computer and not have to spend a single cent, no initial outlay, no subscriptions, nothing, all for free. But if you are someone who has spent the last 20 years of your life learning particular key combinations in particular applications that you are used to, that is one hell of a learning curve to have to jump across onto these applications and then try and be productive on them. You know, if I'm sitting down in front of Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, whatever, these sorts of things, I can move like lightning because I know all the key commands. I know where to find everything. It's all there. With these Although I totally appreciate these are free alternatives, uh, I'm not ready to jump across to all of these just yet. I mean, I, I, I don't really have the time for the learning curve associated with having to, uh, to jump ship. And that is, I guess, probably one of the big problems with this sort of software. If you're starting from scratch, that's great. Learn on a free one. But if you are already have all of this invested this invested knowledge and time in other applications, it's very hard to just jump ship and use something else. Yeah, well, that's not even the apps, the key combinations, the the amount of cursing out of this office <laughs> with me just messing up copy and paste was ridiculous. <laughs> you need to use control instead of command, and it, it yes, just, yeah. Well, well, Bruce, yeah. that's a, an interesting point though, because you, you're talking about it's difficult to jump ship to a free alternative. From one perspective, it's, you know, the the paid stuff that you're used to might be the paid alternative to someone who could never afford that in the first place and started on a lot of the free stuff, uh, and, you know, unless they're pirating things, which I'm sure you're not pirating, you know, Photoshop. Oh, of course, of course. Never in your life. I mean, that's just a <laughs> ridiculous concept. But, you know, if somebody started out using the GIMP or some of the other software there, and then they try to go to Photoshop, they might have a the same totally alien oh. experience and say, you know, why would I pay for this? All the shortcuts are different. The same token though, uh, you, you might think like, why would you want to switch from the software that you're used to, to try this new free and open software? I mean, you, if you're going to try the free and open software, you, you must have some kind of impetus to do it, right? So either you're completely sick of Adobe and now they've moved everything to the cloud and, you know, they turn off a feature because they didn't, like, you know, pay a Pantone subscription or something. You're like, oh, I can't handle this anymore. So you want to explore some of the alternatives. I mean, in that case, sure, there, there might be a learning curve. Um, but if you go deep enough, I mean, the Photoshop example, since GIMP is free and open source software, and actually, I use one called Krita, which is much more Photoshop-like. But there's, there's so many alternatives, and, and people have actually modified Krita to give it all of the Photoshop shortcuts and, and all of this stuff to mm -hmm. ease that transition. Uh, or you can just have fun and learn a new thing. <laughs> that, that's the well, third time where you say something is fun and I completely disagree. <laughs> so it's the opposite. <laughs> but well, I mean, that, that kind of... Don't, yeah, that kind of comes down to, you know, the the point of who Linux is for and why would you choose it in the first place? I mean, we have all, all of these different operating systems. You know, you buy a Mac, it comes with Mac OS. Why on earth would you want to try to put Linux on it? I mean, you have no reason to put Linux on it unless it's something that you want to do. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there, there might be legitimate oh, reasons. <laughs> yeah, like legitimate reasons like one an australian man forces you to do it against your will so you can make money on a, yeah. on a show on youtube or two maybe you just want to do it to, to learn something new which is a well, valid reason to do it and and then that cursing is done for your own benefit there is also a third reason and that is um and this is something that i um i think is a really nifty thing for linux now i just want to say very quickly 
Um, one of the new operating systems, which is Chrome OS, which, of course, they're putting onto their Chromebooks and things like that, that's actually got Linux at its core. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, that's something that I find quite interesting because that's, that's you know, that's now turning into, you know, uh, you know, sort of a, an operating system with, I think, a lot more people using it than, you know, than the tech Linux people. So, but the yeah. fact that it actually has Linux at its core, it gives an indication of its, um, you know, of its, of its strengths. But one, one thing um, that happens with the Mac, so um, I don't want to be, a, 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 you know, sort of an anti tech anti-advancement sort of person. But ultimately, having been in the computer industry for a long time, you know, uh, mainly sort of graphics-based stuff, there was a time when things were always advancing. You know, new things were happening. Every time a new operating, a new piece of software would come out, you, there'd be this new amazing feature. And, you know, we, it was an incredible growth time for that sort of technology. So I say in graphics, when we're talking about, you know, image editing or, you know, sort of, or, or page layout or, you know, graphic design, that sort of stuff. At the time that I was there, it was always advancing. And every time a new version of software would come out, you would just be hanging for it to come out because it would have some fantastic new feature that was going to make you way more productive. Now, I feel like we're well past that now. And we've gone to a point where when companies are having to add stuff, very rarely are they creating innovation. Uh, they're putting little bits here and little bits there, but I haven't really seen anything particularly innovative, certainly in the graphics area, things like Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign. I, I feel like they're just kind of treading water at the moment. And, you know, I pay for them via subscription, but really when they send it, bring a new version out, the only motivation I have to update is if a client sends me a file in that version that I then need to open up. That's the only reason why I'll, up, why I'll update, why I will update. Um, now, um, having said all that, sorry, that was a big, long rant. Um, with uh, with some, a company like Apple, Apple sell hardware. Uh, they give you their operating system for free, but they sell you their hardware. Now, for them, their motivation of releasing new operating systems, try and bring out new features as much as possible, and then, of course, that software is going to get bigger and it's going to run slower on old hardware and then it's going to make you want to buy new hardware. No surprising, okay, I'm not going to criticise Apple for that. That's how they work. Windows have a different motivation. They want their software, they sell their software, so they want it to be installed on as many computers as possible. So for them, they're always going to be keeping a lot of that backwards compatibility in mind. Where Apple are like, here comes a new operating system, doesn't work on, an old on your old computer, so buy a new one. Now, one of the things that ended up happening in the world of computers was, of course, the big SSL um, shift of however many years ago it was where uh, every website that was using an SSL all of a, all of a sudden couldn't be uh, visited on older browsers because they couldn't do the SSL connection properly. And if you have a, an old piece of hardware that will only go up to a certain operating system on the Mac, you can't browse the web with it using sort of the Safari browser and you might be able to download Chrome or whatever. But um, and that that but that that is a cutoff point. You know, there's going to be a point where that hardware can't be used anymore. And this is one thing that I see as a really cool thing about Linux is that you can install Linux on this really old hardware. Even if all you're going to do on it is web browsing an email or something yeah. like that, you can then turn this really old hardware into something functional. Um, so that was a very, very long story to say something very short. Well, it's Sorry very profound, that. though, and I, I agree with it. And it kind of goes back to even what you said about Linux, you know, powering Chrome OS, and it's like under the hood. That's the same with the Steam Deck, right? That's Linux under the hood. And they were able to twist it into doing what they need to play Windows games on Linux on the Steam Deck efficiently, right? So when you have Mac OS, it's Mac OS. When you have Windows, it's just Windows. It can't be anything else, right? But Linux can be anything. It's It's a kernel... And, you know, kind of a, a thing that you can build on top of. So you can make it run on anything, right? So exactly what you said, you can put it on old hardware. Like I had my Power Mac G5 streaming to Twitch with video camera and sound and playing games on the Mac. You know, you, I couldn't really do that with Mac OS that well. No, you know, I'd be lucky no. if I could even connect to the Twitch website because of the SSL thing. And, but uh, what sort of G5? What's that? What sort of G5? The quad. Okay. Yeah, no worries. 
yeah. That's so. that's that's a liquid cooled one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you've you've sorted out that. Yeah. Cooling? So uh, I haven't touched it in a while, so I don't know. It could be leaking as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I digress there for a minute, but I'm a I'm a big G5 fan, so you know. Yeah. That's well, I, I even had you know brand new like modern PCIe graphics cards running under Linux on that thing, and u- yeah. using the stream. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that's kind of do that with um, 10.5. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, that's that's the thing, isn't it? Ten point five is as far as you can go on that on that computer. And that's that's yeah. it. Whereas uh, with Linux, you can you know you sort of there are all these new things becoming available. So, um, so I have a quick question. Mm. I have a G five right there. Granted, it's a flat one. It's an XServe, but what kind of version of Linux would be best for that machine? It's a dual core. A dual CPU G5. Uh, I want to do file sharing, time machine backups, and stuff like that. Is there a Linux suitable for that hardware to do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, anything with that power PC is going to be a little bit more difficult because it's an abandoned platform for the most part. There are Linux distributions that still support it, even Debian, which is what I would recommend for that use case. Uh, there's some other ones that might be easier to install. Um, so I was using, oh crap, I can't remember the name of it. There, there's another distribution that is, uh, you know, they, they kind of tout that they support PowerPC Macintosh. Hmm. The name will come to me randomly. I'll just shout it out. <laughs> okay. no, yeah, yeah, just, that works. just call out when it arrives. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, Deb, Debian surprisingly still supports even 32 bit and 64 bit PowerPC. Well, okay. yeah, cause I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to run these just for shits and giggles there's really not mm-hmm. much to do with them sure. but you know if they can make a if they can do file sharing handle a bunch of clients and a lot of data efficiently on their linux i'm willing to give it a shot efficiently i mean i don't know <laughs> i don't better know than, you've heard about than leopard would do it's kind of subjective isn't it <laughs> yeah no better than leopard would do let's put yeah. it that way um I just thought I'd mention that I actually have a, um, a Mac Mini. It's a 2014. It's the 1.4 gigahertz model with four gigs of RAM or something like that. It is the stupidest Mac Mini that Apple has ever released. That's actually that. There's probably stupider ones, but it's one of the stupider Mac Minis that we just incredibly underpowered. Now, I managed to get it for incredibly cheap because it was damaged, and I repaired it. And it's like, well, here it is. Now, I installed uh, Ubuntu on that, uh, and I have then got some software running on it called ISP Config. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but it is like a free alternative to Web Host Manager or cPanel that allows you to set up multiple hosting environments on the computer so you can um you can actually set up for different clients you can actually i can set up a website for a client put it on there give their own them their own control panel where they can go in and they can set up their own databases for it or control what version of php they want the website to use uh it's a really nice slick piece of software and again this is something that was completely free so that mini uh installed ubuntu installed isp config a couple of tweaks here and there but ultimately it's now just sitting there ticking away um cpu barely goes over about, I don't know, like 10, 20% or something like that. And it is just a really cruisy job for a massively underpowered little um, Mac Mini like that. Um, and I just thought I would make mention of that because that's uh, that's something where I feel that computer would not be getting used if mm-hmm. it weren't for uh, Linux. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's I can't really think of anything else I would do with a computer with only four gigs of RAM. So, um, so just wanted to to just mention that very very briefly. And of course, also just a, you know a mention of that software ISP config. If you are someone who is not just wanting to set up a website, but potentially set up a web host, and then maybe set up multiple websites on that host, then ISP Config is is fantastic. Um, they do have an online forum where, uh, you know, I had one time where I had an instance where I had updated this the Ubuntu or, or something and it had, it had updated to default version of PHP had gone up a version, but this ISP Config um, 
didn't like that latest version. It wasn't ready for it yet. So I had to just make a little setting change to ask this ISP config to use a specific version of PHP rather than just default to whatever the latest version is. And uh, it, you know, and I got help about that, like that, just on the forum. I just put in the question. People gave me the answer really, really quickly. So excellent support for that as well. And again, this is a free piece of software. So so just, you know, wanting to mention that another really cool piece of uh, uh, Linux software. Um, now, Can I just, uh, say something yep. about that? Uh, yes. I feel that what you just brought up, the community aspect of it, is very strong for uh, for Mac, uh, Mac OS, Mac hardware, and for uh, specific software as well. But in the two weeks now that I've been trying to use Linux, I have not found that to be the case for Linux. There are, I think the the sheer amount of distros available fragments the information so much that you don't really, as a novice, you don't really know where to go. Like if I wanted to install something on elementary OS, I would get instructions for Ubuntu and the common ones that wouldn't work on this version of Linux. And once I found mm. information for elementary, it was old, outdated, it hadn't been touched yeah. in a while. And so it, it wasn't as easy for me to find information that I can quickly find for Mac. You know, there's Facebook groups, there's forums, there's tinkerdifferent.com, by the way. It's also there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I had trouble finding the information I needed. Let's put it that way. Mm. So I don't know if you it's know, a community problem or, you know, it's just... You so know, is, that, then. is that necessarily a problem, is my question. It is. Yeah, because, it's fun for you, probably. Because, well, so not, you know, people say, you know, should everybody use Linux? You know, tell everybody to use Linux. But you, you shouldn't, right? You should use the operating system that suits what you want to do with the computer. I would say that the scenario that you just described, you know, yes, it's very fragmented and you got to look everywhere for information. You got to learn all this stuff, figure out how it works, type, type little cryptic messages into the terminal. But at the end of it, you've learned something, right? <laughs> so maybe he's not convinced. Use, look at his face. He's not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you want to use a computer and never learn a thing. <laughs> You want to stare at a pretty looking screen, and then when you're done, just close it. And that's totally valid. We have computers that can do that. They're called Macintosh. <laughs> well, look, one thing I will say is, that, and again, this comes down to the fact that we were, it was our aim that we would use different distros for this experiment. And um, I selfishly chose Ubuntu, yeah. uh, and that was mainly because I had had experience with it before. I regret that now because I had already used Ubuntu and I really should have chosen something that I haven't uh, tried before. But um, what I will say is there seems to be pretty good support for Ubuntu. Oh, yeah. um, I did have one interesting situation with the laptop that I used. So this Macintosh 17-inch uh, MacBook Pro has two graphics cards in it or two graphic GPUs in it. It has a slow one and a fast one. So the slow one is obviously for better battery life and the fast one is for um, better performance. Um, and it switches between the two de depending on the task that, that you're doing. Now, when I installed Ubuntu on it, I might be misinterpreting this, but it, it seemed to behave like there were two displays. Now, I don't know if that is because of the GPU or just something to do with the way it was configured, but I had a really interesting thing when I went to install, uh, was it Thunderbird? That's the, 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 it's something. That's the email. The email software. I went to go install that, launched it, nothing happened. Just sitting there, nothing. Just couldn't launch it. Huh? Try and quit it. No, launch it, nothing. I did a little bit of a Google search and I did actually find someone with the same problem. Uh, now, they didn't know what the solution was and I did find the solution and I then put the solution in that forum but that was this was an ubuntu issue and there was this ubuntu forum with lots of people you know asking questions and getting answers now as it turned out what it was was that the computer seemed to think there were two screens so when i launched thunderbird yeah. it was launching it into a screen that wasn't there and all i had to do was go into the display settings and get it to kind of mirror the displays rather than treat them as two different ones, and then all of a sudden that window just suddenly came back. So, but that was uh, a, a, an annoyance, but it was something that I, um, uh, you know, uh, 
I was able to, you know, then give some information back to the community if some if that happens to someone in the future. Mm -hmm. Obviously, very specific to that hardware because this person having the problem <clears throat> was also using a 17-inch MacBook Pro. So, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, something uh, specific to that model. But now, um, that what you've seen so far, would you would you consider Linux as a daily driver? Me? Yeah. Fuck no. <laughs> No, I mean, look, you know, in all seriousness, so, so I, I mean, I'll just tell you, just very quickly talk about some of the experiences and we'll, you know, I'll, 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 Jay, Jay, I'll get you to talk about some of your experiences with the installation as well. So the installation all went fine. I installed um, a bunch of different software on there. I installed Firefox for the browser, Thunderbird Mail, WhatsApp, uh, GIMP, Inkscape, Plex, Zoom, Dropbox, Visual Studio Code, which is for writing code, um, VLC Player, LibreOffice, Discord, Scribus, that's a page layout application, and DaVinci Resolve. Now, I already mentioned DaVinci Resolve. I could not get that to run, but I still installed it on there. Now, every other application that I just described there, I was able to just download. This is with the exception of DaVinci. I was able to just download from that little snappy, yappy thing that we installed on there. And so I was able to just literally search for the name and then press the install button, away we went. So that 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 process was really, really easy. I had that little bit of an issue with Thunderbird trying to get it. Once I had that figured out, that was fine. Um, <clears throat> WhatsApp was a bit tricky because there's no official WhatsApp client on uh, Linux, but there are lots and lots of WhatsApp compatible clients on there, um, which I just chose one which was sort of recommended. Um, and I did have an issue with when I tried to launch two of applications, I don't remember which two, but I would launch two applications and the computer would just freeze and crash and stuff like that. Um, the... Um, I did mention that I had a lot of trouble from a productivity perspective. Uh, the couple of things, first of all, on the Mac, I'm used to Apple C, Apple V, copy paste, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, we're now into the control key, which feels very Windowsy to me. You know, I can get used to it, but I, you know, I missed that that side of it. It doesn't work with the right clicking on the trackpad of the Mac, so that hasn't been configured for Ubuntu. So if I'm wanting to do a, a right click on something, I, I either need to change some settings in there to get it to, to do it some other way, like in the accessibility settings, or use an external mouse. So typically on a Mac, where if you press on the right side of the trackpad, it's a right click. If you press on the left side of the trackpad, it's a left click. And that didn't work in Ubuntu. So that was that was definitely a, a frustrating thing because the contextual menus are pretty important with a lot of stuff in there. Um, but um, the thing I probably missed the most or that I missed the most stops it from being able to be a daily driver for me is one of the most used applications that I have is Apple Messages. I keep in touch. Virtually everyone I know, you know, has an iPhone or whatever. And so I have group message chats in there where I'm in touch with people all day, every day, you know, whether it be family, whether it be friends, whether it be like the Mac Yak guys or, you know, whatever the case is. And so there is no Apple messages in Linux, nor will there ever be. I mean, it's not like Apple's going to make uh, one for it. Um, and so well, they that's made it. iTunes for Windows, so you never know. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Um, but I just, I don't see it. I don't see it. And so for me, that was one thing that I re really missed. So I, you know, um, I like to have the messages app on whatever computer I'm using to just sort of stay in touch with people. Interestingly enough, no Facebook Messenger either. Now, of course, you can use Facebook Messenger within the browser, but in terms of having it as a separate application, uh, you know, there's a separate application on Windows, there is on Mac, but they haven't made one for Linux, which surprised me. I would have thought that Facebook's would have Facebook would have made a, a, a Linux Messenger application, but the not they haven't. Um, on the whole, it was fairly um, sort of buggy at times. I, I was told that I needed to update the Snap application thing, but it wouldn't let me update it because it was running. So I literally had to go into the terminal to kill it and then update it via the terminal. So this idea that you've got this pretty interface and that you're not going to have to use the terminal is, for me, is is a 
is a farce. The um, as nice as they make those graphic user interfaces, the terminal is an inevitability within Linux. You are going to be in terminal at some stage doing something, um, whether it be an installation of an application that doesn't work with the um, the little app snap app thing or whether it just be from something that's going wrong or some weirdness that's happening and then you'll have to go into the terminal and do it there so I, i'm not saying that this would be something i would set up to for my grandmother to you know browse the web or something like that but i also do appreciate that linux is a nice way to just set up a little computer for just browsing an email um i you know i think it's it, it's definitely good for that um so, Jay, can you talk us a little bit more about the all of the fun and joy that you had when you were using elementary? The biggest mistake I made was to use a 13-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, not because of the hardware, but if I, if I really want to give Linux a fair shake, I need to put it on my Mac Pro with two displays and actually get a chance to use it. Uh, so I don't think... It made a good impression on me because I hate tiny screens and I hate having just one screen. Uh, the learning curve annoyed me because I was forced to do this against my will. Uh, but also because I'm trying to find a way to say, oh, yes, if, if all else fails and Linux is all I have, I can make this work. But I can't. There's no Photoshop. There's no, there's no security camera software that I use. There's no Apple messages. That, nothing that I use has a Linux version. So everything would have to be learned from scratch. Now, if I'm going to do that, I might as well do it on my Mac. Like, I would love to ditch Adobe, but I have no financial incentive to, to learn a new app because it's not my job. I don't work in graphics, but I would love to learn Affinity. They have great products that run better and faster than any Adobe app does, but I don't have an incentive to put in the time to learn it. Neither do I have that with Linux. At the end of the day, I watched a few movies on Plex, and that's really all I did with it. Um, but yeah, I can see it being useful, just not for me. Sorry, I tried. And uh, Sean, you said that you actually uh, use Linux as a daily driver for a while. Mm -hmm. um, did with was there stuff that you missed while you were using it? Yeah, um, yeah, yes, and no. Um, and you know, th there's kind of I think another layer to the whole premise of should you use Linux as a daily driver? Um, mm -hmm. And I think. For me, a good example would be when you were talking, Bruce, about the issues you had with your dual graphics card setup, because I had very similar issues with Linux, right? So I had my MSI Prestige 15. That was my daily driver on Linux for over a year, and that has dual graphics cards. And the distribution that I was using at the time did not like it at all, did not work out of the box. To try to get that second graphics card to even work at all it was just endless tinkering and reading in forums, trying to figure it out. I could get it to you use one or the other, but not switch. And it, you know, it never quite worked right. Um, but it kind of comes down to expectations, right? Like I wasn't frustrated, like angry, frustrated about that because I knew using Linux, this is a possibility. It, I might have to tinker endlessly to get it to work, for me, that's kind of a, a positive, right? I enjoy doing that. So coming into Linux from another operating system, I think it's important to ask yourself, why, why are you coming into Linux from another operating system? Should this be your daily driver? Um, using Linux, you know, there, there were some things I missed, but in actuality, I was able to get pretty close to 100% of everything from every other platform that I use, Mac and Windows, right? So I had, you know, Windows applications running under Linux. I had Steam running both the Windows and the Linux version of Steam. Steam released something called Proton, which is what powers the Steam Deck. So I could play 
Windows based Steam games on my Linux laptop once I got that graphics card working uh, mm -hmm. way better than even the Linux versions, native versions would run. Um, and sitting on the couch with my wife using her MacBook Pro, she was immensely jealous that I could run all of these Windows games on my Linux laptop and she couldn't run any of them on her Mac. <laughs> But the thing is, I, I made it work, right? As a like a force of will, getting that graphics card to work. Um, and I enjoyed every minute of doing it. Now, I brought a prop. So I'm going to go into a little bit of a, a show and tell here. So does anybody recognize what this is? This little is that a printer thingy? thingy? It, it looks like it's a, a spool of some sort. Okay, let me uh, open it up and maybe you'll have a better, better understanding here. Okay, so you see all these little blue gears in here. There's a little, yeah. little motor there, worm gear. Anybody have any idea what this is? I thought you were professionals. I mean, this nope. is obviously... I've never seen that before. This is obviously the uh, climate control motor out of my late 90s Jeep Cherokee. Uh, yes. And I drive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which had a problem with the climate control. It wasn't blowing out hot air. So I took this off and started tinkering with it to see if I could fix it, right? Uh -huh. So this is a, a 90s car, and it, it's not a perfect analogy, of course, because Linux is extremely modern. But on this 90s car, I can take everything off. I can tinker with it. I can figure out what doesn't work. You know, I wanted to put Android Auto, wireless Android Auto in there. So I hacked up the dashboard. And I stuck it in there. And now it works great. Like uh, my wife drives a much newer sedan. She doesn't have wireless Android Auto in there. You know, <laughs> my Jeep didn't have heated seats. I put them in there. I made it work, right? Mm. Now, my wife would not want to drive my old creaky Jeep, right? But I love it. I much prefer drive that than anything. You know, and I think it comes down to... You know, a decent analogy for would you want to daily drive Linux versus something that just works, right? Like you can go to the dealership, you can buy a car with the heated seats, with, you know, Android Auto Wireless built in. Or you can buy an old car that you really like, tinker with it. You know, it's not that complicated. Once you know how it works, you can make it do what you want. And it's yours. You know, you can upkeep it. It's not that expensive. You don't have to, you know, if something starts rattling, you don't have to have that, you know, stressful call to the dealer. Like, oh, God, how much is this going to cost? You mm -hmm. just you know, tear off the panel and say, oh, there it is. Rip it out and start, you know, futzing with it. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I get the analogy. That's that's why farmers will pay extra for a 20 year old uh farm implement over buying a brand new John Deere. You know, they have control over what they own. And that's yeah. why I got a 2005 riding lawnmower with a blown engine and the wires all chewed up and fixed it up because there's not a single computer chip in it. So yeah. I can get it to do what I want it to do. So I get the analogy and I'm not anti Linux. Sure. And if you ever quote me on this, I'll deny it, but I'm not anti windows either. Whatever works for you works for you. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I don't have the incentive to ditch Mac OS. Now, with the newest Mac I have uh, is a 2015 MacBook Pro. It can keep up with uh, Ventura with, uh, with a few minor hacks and stuff. But my main driver, this Mac Pro, 2012 Mac Pro, is probably the end of the line, the operating system I'm currently on. How long can I make this last? You know? I'm not forced to upgrade to the latest version of Adobe. Hell, Adobe CS2 would work fine for me. Uh, so I can make this last forever. <clears throat> but at some point, do I get a newer Mac to support the newer operating system? Is the price ridiculous? Is the, the T2 or T8 chip, you know, such a disaster that I can't possibly justify it? I might switch to Linux and... This Mac Pro with the current version of Mac OS is fast. This Mac Pro with a slick version of Linux on it is going to probably blow me away. So then I will have at least a financial incentive to say, hey, you know what? It's worth me learning GIMP over Photoshop. 
or doing learning this or learning that. So I'm I'm not I'm open to it if it ever comes down to it, but uh, I don't see it happening anytime soon. But I'm I'm grateful for it being out there. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I think that's the best possible mindset, which really shocks me coming from you, Jay. I really, that's really <laughs> wonderful. Yes. That's really wonderful. Now, I think I completely misinterpreted your analogy there, Sean. So essentially, you're saying that cries the build quality is a big problem. That's why it's really what you're saying. Wasn't Here it? we go. Well, yeah. So Chrysler is basically the elementary OS of vehicles. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I put together, I guess, a bit of a, a kind of a pros and cons thing about sort of uh, Linux versus the Mac OS. Now, I've got a lot more in the cons pile than I have in the pros pile, but I will just mention a couple of things here. So one of the things that I really did like about Linux is it's there's almost a sort of contrary to what you were saying, Jay, I almost feel like there's a bit of a... Uh, an exclusive club sort of feel about it. You know, there are other Linux users out there. And, you know, again, I was talking about back in the olden days when I was a sort of a, a Mac user in the, the 80s and 90s where we were such a, a small exclusive club. You know, it was almost like, uh, you know, the, the, there was a, you know, sort of camaraderie, I suppose, between, you know, other, other Mac users because you just sort of, you just felt like you were you know, part of this very small and exclusive club. And I sort of feel like there's a bit of that with the Linux world, you know, that if you are the sort of person that's delving into Linux and you're trying things out and you're tinkering or whatever the case may be or, you know, trying to get things working, that certainly I got this this sort of feeling of, of um, you know, being part of a community, I suppose, of other people that are do, doing the same sort of stuff and then are of, of a similar mindset with that. So I felt that was kind of a, a nice thing about, about Linux, um, the freeness, the no, uh, the no cost, the fact that you don't have to pay any money for it is a massive pro with these. Uh, same with the not just the distros but the software as well. Uh, the speed and the performance, you know, because there's they're a lot more um, lightweight and the fact that they get um, the most out of old hardware. And then the other thing I will say was the pro was a very easy installation for me. So for me, it was just like boom, away you go, and it just worked. Everything worked, networking worked, you know, um, sort of everything with the, you know, battery and sleep and all that sort of, everything just worked. So I was I was happy with that. Now, before you um, move to the cons, can I just ask one thing? Mm. Why are you smiling? I'm not going to say anything stupid. <laughs> when I ask people... I know what you! <laughs> what is so great about Linux? The number one thing everybody will come up with, it's free, it's free. Mm. So is Mac OS. Like, mm. why is being yeah. free such a big selling point over mm. the free Mac OS and the same free open source software we can run on Mac OS? Why is free mm. so such a big selling point? Well, yeah, they I, free. Yeah. They kind of mean free and open source a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The open the open source is probably one of one of the big oh, okay. things there. Yeah, so it's like people mixing up Unix and Linux. It's not yeah, the same. So thing not free as in free beer, but free as in I can do what I want. Mm. Okay. All right. I get it. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think the cost is a thing as well. I mean, of course, that again, that impacts probably more on Windows users than it does on Mac OS users. Because as you say, um, as long as you're running sort of Mac hardware, supported Mac hardware, then uh, the the um, sort of OS downloads are, are free. So yeah. Uh, um, I thought of something else while uh, you were talking there, but it's gone from my brain now. It's just... Should have written it down. Should have written it down. Yeah. Told you I can't remember anything, so I have to write stuff down. Uh, never mind, never mind. So I will now launch into the cons, and I will try and keep this fairly quick. Uh, first thing, buggy. Really buggy. Uh, things just not doing what they're meant to do uh, for no apparent reason, fire them up, they don't work, fire them up a second time and they do work. Um, you know, I just found it a, it definitely did not have the sort of a more slick feeling of using a Mac OS. The Mac OS much more polished. You feel like it's been through a lot more testing of lots of different things. And so for me, I definitely felt Linux was a little bit buggy. Now, again, that's part of a challenge, really, isn't it? If you are someone that tinkers, I mean, you know, getting it everything working just right is part of the joy of it, as you were saying, Sean. Um, I mentioned the not uh, no support for the right clicking on the MacBook Pro trackpad. 
Uh, no support for control clicking. You can, so that was another thing. And you couldn't even press control and click to get a contextual menu. So that was something that I found a little bit annoying. Um, nothing tells you if an application is launching. Now, again, this could just be the Ubuntu um, distro. But it, you've got your little dock down there and you press an app. Uh, and on the Mac, when it's launching, it sort of bounces up and down, and so you know what's going on, and then you might get a splash screen or whatever, but you know that the computer is thinking about it. Nothing like that on, on Ubuntu. So when you click on an application, you think you've clicked on it, but you're just sitting there waiting and nothing's happening. And if you're working on a slow computer, is it working? Is it not working? Yeah, it was the same on elementary. Yeah. So and then eventually the application just opens up. It's like, oh, well, wow, okay, it was working. Everything was fine. I just didn't know. There was zero indication of the computer actually working on something. Um, oh, I remembered what I was going to say with the pros. Of course, the other thing is that Linux is a very, very good multitasker. So this is obviously one of the things that I love about the Mac OS as well. I love that when you have multiple things open, how well it handles that. And Linux, I say the same thing about that. Linux is a very good multitasking operating system. So that's back up in the pros up there. We'll just push that back up in the pros. Um, so, um, yep, I mentioned the, the cons, the control key. Uh, and I mentioned that you're going to end up in the terminal no matter what. Uh, so, you know, Linux definitely not one for novices, I guess, from that regard. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, I think I've pretty much mentioned all of those, uh, the, the cons already is we've just, uh, you know, sort of we've, we've talked about this other stuff. So, um, so that was kind of my, my pros and cons list. I, I mean, Jay, I think you have probably prattled off all of your cons, but did you have any more that you wanted to mention? Oh, uh, we can keep going forever. Um, the biggest one, uh, and I spent two days on this, uh, at least in my distro, there are no buttons to minimize a window. So I ended up on the dark web in the Ukraine in someone's basement, and he had some commands to try out, and uh, that will install something, then you have to install something else, then you have to homebrew something on top of that, restart, Bam, minimize button, you're all set. Two days later, no minimize button. I've installed who knows what kind of ransomware on here. <laughs> Only to find out that when you click the dock icon, it minimizes for you. <laughs> they could have mentioned this somewhere. That's all I'm saying. Oh, dear. I'll tell you yeah. one really weird experience that I had while I was using uh, Ubuntu. Uh, settings. So it's like on the Mac, you've got your control panels sort of thing. Settings just disappeared, just gone, gone from the computer. Search for it. It's not the icon's gone. The app's gone. It's just gone. It's just disappeared. And I then did a Google search. Someone said, yeah, run this. And so I ran that, run a command line, and it, it reinstalled settings, and then we're back. And I just, for the life of me, I cannot figure why settings just disappeared from my computer. So um, now, Sean, you might struggle with this, but... Do you have any cons? Oh, yeah. You know? Uh, okay. Well, I've Fire got away. one very big con, mm -hmm. and that is the barrier to entry really is the amount of choice, right? So a lot of the stuff that you were talking about isn't necessarily bugs in Linux, right? But it's maybe bugs in trying to use Linux on a Mac. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes towards but actually Windows has the same problem, you know, Mac OS is so tightly integrated with the Mac hardware, it doesn't have to worry about trying to be installed on, you know, some Acer Aspire that you bought at Walmart on discount with, you know, who knows if the RAM even, you know, both chips work. Um, but Windows does. Windows, they're writing one thing that's supposed to run on every, you know, x86 computer linux has kind of that same issue but there's so much variety in linux like windows is just windows but linux you have all these different distributions that are all trying to run on every different random computer from a you know a quad g5 power mac to you know computers that are purpose built to run linux you can have a really good linux experience right out of the box buying you know ibm or Lenovo sells ThinkPads <laughs> that run Linux. Dell sells some professional laptops that run Linux out of the box. And they have a very 
you know, well tested experience against the hardware that it's on. Uh, and you would open it up, everything works. It's never going to crash. It's it's beautiful unless you start messing with it, which is what Linux people do. But from that perspective, the biggest con, I think, is that barrier to entry of choice. You know, where do you even start installing Linux? You know, do you have a favorite distro? I yeah, I've always used Ubuntu when I just need it to work, uh, but I've always researched the computer first to make sure you know what quirks it's going to have. Should I even bother putting Ubuntu on this? Second to that is Arch Linux, which is the meme, of course. You know, by the way, I use Arch, but there's just you know, I, I installed that more to learn more about Linux because it does not have a user friendly install process. Uh, you know, you're doing the whole thing from start to finish in the command line, basically. Mm. Uh, yeah, sounds like fun. It was. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I I was gonna when you came up with this. Uh, brilliant idea of let's use linux for a while and uh, compare notes i was gonna say ha i already run linux in my basement my firewall is running linux but i just looked it up it's not it's free it's free bsd so it didn't count oh, nice. that's a good one <laughs> so out of the 587 different linux distros i do my research and like ha that's the one i want how do i know if it's a good choice because uh, the most common one is uh, Ubuntu, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting that gets updated the most often. Uh, elementary might get an update every once a year, maybe. Uh, I'm just making these numbers up. How do you know which Linux is a good fit for you that doesn't leave you hanging high and dry a year down the road? I think it's important to start from what you want the distribution to do because there is so much choice and they make so many distributions that are kind of purpose built. I mean, even within Ubuntu itself, there's like Ubuntu studio. If you know that you want all the creator stuff and you know, you want GIMP, you want music creation software out of the box, you know, and then there's also very lightweight versions of Ubuntu. If all you care about is speed, you know, my laptop's from 2007 and I needed to browse the internet as quickly as possible. So you have to start from, you know, what do you want it to do? If you want the easiest possible experience, you should probably use Ubuntu and make sure that your laptop is reasonably up to date and not some funky, you know, I ordered it from Alibaba with, you know, weird hardware in it. You know, something normal. You'll have a good experience. But if you want to experiment, if you want to learn new things, if, if you want, you know, the best possible developer environment, you know, there, there's all different distributions. Um, DistroWatch is a great site to kind of learn about different distributions and, and what they do and what they're for. Um, yeah. Do your research. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was thinking more from a uh, security perspective. Like I would be more than happy to run Snow Leopard for the rest of my life. Oh, sure. I'd die a happy man. Uh, but security-wise, yeah. Security wise, it's not a great idea to do your online banking if it even loads the banking website at this point. It probably will with Firefox, but from a security perspective, I, I happily run Mac OS 9, set up a server, and, and leave it unattended because I trust my firewall. I, I have a firewall set up because all the stuff on my network is so old and unsecure. How worried do you have to be about that with Linux? If you, if you pick a distro that barely ever sees any updates is that a big concern or not really yeah well again going back to so much choice right so on one end of the spectrum you have rolling release distributions that as soon as an update comes through and they vet it it you can install it on your computer so you're always as up-to-date as you can possibly be without it breaking then there's something like stock ubuntu which you know in the interest of not accidentally breaking your system, they take a little bit longer to vet stuff, but still you're getting more frequent updates than even modern Mac OS does. The other end of the spectrum, there's stuff like Hannah Montana Linux, right? Which hasn't been updated since, you know, she's not even called Hannah Montana anymore. So that shows you how old it is, right? So don't do your online banking from Hannah Montana Linux. And if you want something that's going to be your daily driver and you want it to be secure, you just have to pick one of the, big ones one of the ones that's going to be frequently updated it's from a 
you know, a company or an organization. It's not from, you know, that guy in Ukraine whose basement that you got those commands from. He I mean, he sounded it. nice, so, but you know. <laughs> and his distro might be great today, bleeding edge, but then he forgets about it for a while. And, uh, you know, yeah. then all of a sudden it's not so updated anymore and there's no support for him, you know, that's in English. It's all in Ukrainian. So, yep. yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a real downside. Yes. Okay. Well, I think the uh, the ultimate conclusion is that sixty six percent of the people here uh, want nothing to do with Linux. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, you re- do you remember my example from earlier about my old Jeep? I'd like to conclude with something that completely obliterates my kind of positive thing, right? So I pulled mm-hmm. this thing out because I'm not getting heat out of my Jeep, right? And I took it apart and I took a battery and I hooked it up to this motor. And guess what? All the gears spin. So this isn't even the issue, right? <laughs> like I tore skin off my finger trying to get to this stupid bolt that was all the way next to the transmission tunnel. There's absolutely no way to like get it. I had to just hold the socket in my hand to unscrew it, right? I went through all that effort in the cold to get this out. This thing isn't even the issue. So I have to go back in and go to the next thing in the line that could be the issue. Maybe I have to flush the heater core. I don't know. I'm going to read some forums and find out. So from that (laughs) perspective, this is a lot like using Linux, right? I have all the power and all the tools to to do it and figure it out. And maybe it's painful. And uh, yeah, sometimes it's absolutely annoyingly difficult but i'm looking forward to uh going into the next thing and trying to get this thing back in there and aligned <laughs> that's a that's well, a good mindset it'll, though it'll, and i think it, it applies to most of the stuff we do whether it's mac or uh, board repair or whatever car maintenance if you if you are curious and mm. you don't mind you know the occasional skin <laughs> piece of skin missing and stuff like that it, I get how it can be fun, uh, and specifically to Linux, it was it was fun to to see it in action because I've never run Linux on anything. I think I've tried Ubuntu once a few years ago. Um, yeah, you know, it lasted ten minutes. I was like, "What am I doing?" <laughs> Got rid of it. But you know, I know it's out there. I know that if uh, the white MacBook that I have is uh, for some reason the only Mac left after an EMP of uh, whatever. Figure something out. Think of something. A polycarbonate protects against it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Linux will run on it, and I might actually be able to do some productive stuff. So, I, like I said, I appreciate it being out there. Uh, I will, for the foreseeable future, enjoy seeing it on your channel and not in my <laughs> office but uh yeah it's uh it, it was a fun challenge i cursed a lot i wasted a lot of time but it was it was fun is, is well, time spent that's fun really wasted <laughs> never mm. um well one thing i will say is that as i mentioned i installed this onto this uh 2017 um yeah macbook pro yeah, you know, it runs quite well, runs quite quick and everything like that. And I had on my table, I had this, this 17-inch MacBook Pro with uh, Ubuntu on it, and I had a 2014 11-inch MacBook Air, one of Jay's favorite computers. So I have got this pokey screen little MacBook Air there, and then I've got this absolutely beautiful 17-inch display, delicious, sharp, contrasty color and everything like that with Ubuntu on it. And every time I wanted to do something, I kept on reaching for the bloody MacBook, little MacBook Air. So that just gives you the indication of how I just just virtually almost like subconsciously was just like, oh, I can't be bothered dealing with Linux today. I'm just going <laughs> to just gotta grab the MacBook Air. So, yeah. Like, even though the Air is so much more useless than that thing, <laughs> I'll still use this. <laughs> Over Linux. And that's what happened. That's what happened, you know. Yeah. So yeah. uh but anyhow, look, it was a, it was an interesting experiment. Um it was the experiment was so interesting it actually scared Dana away. <laughs> um so uh, for the record, I believe he was gonna use Lubuntu with an L in front of it. Mm-hmm. Um it's I don't know choice. if he ever actually got to install it, but I read that that's more Mac oriented as well, right? Or it's not. much uh 
much lower hardware requirements. Uh, I, I would say that Ubuntu proper is more Mac ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I might be mixing kind of stuff up. I think yeah. it was for the older hardware, like you mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we we'll uh, never know. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's right. Mm-hmm. We won't. Um, so anyhow. Um, I think I'm probably going to wrap it up now, unless anyone has anything more, anything of interest to say. I still got um, six pages of cons if you want to go through them. <laughs> well, I just want to say that I, I really like that uh, 11 inch Mac. Uh, I have one. I'm going to install Linux on it. Yeah, do it's it. A perfect do it. Let's- piece. For Let us know how it goes. Yes, there's no way I'm going to do that to mine. No way. But uh, um, but yes, I'd be very interested to know how it runs on the uh, on the little MacBook Air. So the, the my MacBook Air is my it's my um, glove compartment computer. So if I'm yeah, going away on a holiday, yeah, yeah, you just chuck it in the glove box, and and it's like then if someone calls me and says, "Hey, I forgot my password," I can look it up and send it. Yeah, to why me. not leave a tiny unprotected lithium ion battery in a 50 degrees Celsius glove compartment. <laughs> Great idea. It's a little uh, bit cooler in the glove compartment. Now, four to five people watching this later, if they are, are inspired by our adventures and they're going to try Linux, uh, what what would you like to hear from those people in the comments? Like, just, I like oh, it, yeah. I didn't like it, or suggestions for other people Look, that might be reading it? The, in terms of what goes into the comments of this video, for again, for those five people who do end up watching, um, would love to hear about other people's experiences with Linux or any tips or tricks that they might have. Um, if they are someone who, after watching this, says, you know what, I'm going to give Linux a try. And the sorts of it, reasons people might have that, they might say, you know what, I've got this old 2011 MacBook in the in the cupboard. I might put Linux on it and give it a new lease on life, that sort of thing. So someone does get inspired to go and do this. Um, uh, we would love to hear from you. Please put that in the comments. Uh, we'll also have links in the description for some of these different distros and where you can download them. As we mentioned before, you obviously download the uh, the disk image and then you use Belina Etcher. We'll put a link in for Belina Etcher um, and some of the various software they've talked here, some of this uh, things like GIMP and Inkscape and all these these uh, applications that we've discussed uh, in the show. So that'll all be in the descriptions if you want to get any of that information. But yeah, please uh, leave any Linuxy based stuff in the description. Please, uh, if you disagree with everything we say, uh, please let us know. Uh, always love to hear from anyone and everyone about everything and anything. And if you so, agree with everything that I said, feel free to leave that in the comment below. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, because Sean is the guest on this show, he's not normally on this show. If there are any problems or anyone complaining, we will just basically blame Sean for everything. So that's yeah. sort of, yeah. that's just the the standard yeah. thing. We always blame the guest. That's how it works. But I'll Sean, thank you. for number in the description. <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah, excellent. Um, I like it. Yeah, so, Sean, thank you very much for being on the show and sharing your uh, your significant knowledge on Linux. You uh, uh, you were definitely able to explain a lot of things to me that I wasn't aware about, so I appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me. This was fun. Oh, it's yeah, our pleasure. fun hanging out. Yeah, like, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Leave the comments, and uh, we'll see you at the next show. So, oh, bye now. See ya. Hi there, my name is Bruce and I'm here today. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so it begins. Take it on. I will be the voice of uh, hate and questions tonight. My na- Did you fucking change my name to Bob? <laughs> I was going to see if you were going to read it. <laughs> if you were an autopilot. <laughs> uh, okay. I haven't shaved in a week for the occasion. so It's a lot of gray hair. Wow. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> uh, Sean, would you like to come back two weeks from now on our most dangerous inventions episode? <laughs> <laughs>